Welcome to another short video on imaging and nuclear medicine. In this video, we want to have a brief look at the two main modalities that we use for 3D tomographic imaging in nuclear medicine. So before uh, diving into those two main modalities, let's quickly refresh our memory what we need to do to do tomography. And um, a crucial term in tomography is the so-called projection or the parallel projection. So what is a projection? So let's say we want to image the 3D distribution of a quantity of interest. So in nuclear medicine, that would be the activity or the tracer concentration of our radio tracer. Let's say we have a brain here. So we have 3D distribution of the tracer in the brain. So a projection would be if you would take this 3D distribution and we would project it onto one plane. You can do that by calculating the line integrals along a certain direction. So we have many line integrals, all for example here in this example, going in the vertical direction, so from top to bottom. So if you do that, we project the 3D distribution into a 2D plane. And of course, I can do that, or we can do that in different directions. So here, for example, the 45 degree projection, then a 90 degree projection. So this would be basically looking through the brain from uh, left to right, so you would get that projection. You can do it for 135 degrees and of course also for 180 degrees. So in the end, we obtain a series, so from a 3D distribution, we can obtain a series of 2D projection images. And then actually it was shown already in the beginning of the 20th century, so around 1917 by the Austrian mathematician Johann Radon that if you collect many of those projections or of those line integrals and they are well sampled, you can actually reconstruct back the 3D distribution of your quantity of interest. So in our case, it would be the activity distribution or the tracer distribution. So the key to do tomographic image reconstruction is to somehow acquire those projections. So how do we acquire those projections in nuclear medicine. As I told you uh, already, there are two main ways of doing that. The first one is called single photon emission computer tomography or also SPECT. And SPECT uses uh, radioisotopes that emit single gamma rays, so single photons. So let's think of a, a toy example. So we have a patient indicated by the gray ellipse here. And let's assume in that patient we have four regions that accumulated the radio tracer. So we get actually single gamma emissions from four different spots, so from the four blue spots. And of course, uh, a single gamma emitter emits gamma rays not only in one direction, but in all directions, so in all four pi, right? Um, so, and I've colored those emissions in a different direction with different colors. So red is the vertical direction, green is the horizontal, and black is the 45 degree direction. So you could naively think that, okay, what would happen if you just take a single detector that can detect single gamma rays? If I place it at a certain position, what is the detector actually seeing? And if you look at that arrangement, you can actually see, unfortunately, of course, there is no, ang so there is no angular information in the detected events. So of course, this detector will see photons coming from all directions, right? So it will see the red photons coming from that emission point, but it of course will also see the black photons coming from that emission point. So if we simply do that, we don't acquire a projection. But there's an easy way to fix that. So we can just use what's called mechanical collimation. So if you put a bit of metal here at the sides of the detector, so to create basically a narrow hole or a narrow tunnel, we can black, uh, we can, sorry, we can block the photons that come here from the oblique directions. So in that way, now the detector is only sensitive to photons coming from basically this line or this volume here, which is actually proportional to the line integral of all the activity along that line. So this is exactly what we need. And then of course, instead of using one collimated detector, you can use many collimated detectors. And if you do that, of course, then you require many of those projection lines. And you can see 
an example of such a system actually here. So this is a clinical uh, SPECT system, as you can find it in many in many hospitals. And um, so you can see here, this is a detector head containing many detectors and a collimator. So the collimator actually is shown here. So keep in mind that the way I've shown it here is not really how a detector head in a SPECT system works, but for just understanding the basic principle, that's, that's uh, enough. And actually, if you look at the camera, you can see there's not only one detector head, but two detector heads. So there's another one here. So there would be another detector head here. And those detector heads, they can first of all move in the vertical direction. So you can move them, you can bring them very close to the patient. We will see later why this is important. And moreover, you can also rotate the detector heads around the patient. So you can acquire projections from all different angles, what we need for tomographic image reconstruction. So in that way, we can acquire all our projection images and we can do image reconstruction. The second modality is called PET or positron emission tomography. In PET life is a bit simpler. So if you remember in PET, we use radioisotopes that emit positrons and then the positrons after decay or the emitted positrons they annihilate with an electron into two 511k we gamma photons. Unfortunately, they are emitted back to back. So the angle between them is to very good approximation. It's 180 degrees. It's not exactly 180 degrees, but it's very close to 180 degrees. So they're emitted back to back. So if we now actually put a complete ring of small detectors around our patient, if you look at the individual detectors, of course, an individual detector still sees photons from all the directions, right? So if you would focus on that detector, that will see uh, photons from that emission point, but also photons from that emission point, and of course, also photo from, photons from that emission point. But if you use a trick, so if you look at uh, what we call coincidence detection, so basically we look which or we look at pairs of detectors that saw uh, or that detected photons within a very short amount of time, which is usually called the coincidence window. So that window is a few nanoseconds. So let's say, for example, we saw that this detector saw a photon, and then within a short amount of time, this detector here saw a photon as well. Then we can assume that um, those two photons came from the same positron-electron annihilation. And that means, of course, since the photons are emitted back to back, that we know that the positron electron annihilation must have happened somewhere on the line connecting those detectors. And the same is, of course, true for any pair of detectors. So we can connect those two detectors. So any coincident detections that we see between those detectors must have happened somewhere on the line between the detectors. And of course, I can do that for the, all the vertical lines and all for the oblique lines. So by basically, Recording all those coincidence detections, we measure all the projections that we need. And the important difference compared to SPECT is that here in the PET scanner, we don't need to collimate our detectors. And this is nice because, of course, a collimator blocks a huge part of the incoming photons. So that actually leads to a loss of, of sensitivity. As an example, you can see here a clinical PET system. Actually, you can't see too much. Um, this is actually a PET CT combination. So there's a CT scanner here, and then somewhere behind there's a ring of PET detectors. Um, not too interesting to see, but if you're ever in a, in a hospital, you will see those devices. Let's have a quick uh, look at the comparison between the two modalities. So in, as I told you, in, in SPECT, the principle is that we use single gamma emitters uh, we have collimated detectors in, in a detector head and we rotate that detector head or multiple of those heads around um, the patient to acquire all the projections. In contrast, in PET, we use what is sometimes called electronic collimation. So we look at coincidence detections between two detectors to get the all the projections that we need. Um, if you compare the sensitivity, so that's basically how many of the emitted photons do we really detect? That is quite low in SPECT. Um, 
depends a bit on the collimator that you use, but basically the collimator blocks most of your incoming photons. So the sensitivity can be around one in, in 10,000. In PET, because we don't need a collimator, the sensitivity is actually way higher. So that can be to one in 100 or even higher. Now it depends a bit on how long your, your PET system is. So sensitivity in PET is way higher than in inspect. In terms of resolution, so if we look at standard whole body scanners uh, as used in every hospital, we also see that the resolution of the reconstructed images is way higher. So in, in modern PET scanners, that's around five millimeters now. In modern SPECT scanners, that depends a bit on the, on the SPECT system and especially on the collimator that you use. But typically, typical benchmark right now is around 10 millimeters. So also the resolution in PET of the PET images is usually way higher than the resolution of SPECT images in whole body human imaging. Um, the most common isotopes that are used in SPECT uh, is by far 99 meter stable technetium. And in PET it's, well, the classical famous positron images are F18, carbon 11, and also gallium 68 lately. An important difference is also if you calculate the costs that are needed to basically do a SPECT or a PET uh, examination. So the costs of a SPECT scan are much lower than the costs of a PET scan. So that's why if you go to any nuclear medicine department, you will see, still see many SPECT scanners um, that are used because yeah, they're just more cost effective. So for example, we know that we can image uh, bone metabolism with SPECT traces. So for example, phosphonates uh, labeled by technetium, but we can also do, we can also image the bone metabolism by sodium fluoride. So that's a PET tracer. And from the image quality point of view, of course, it's way better to do a SPECT scan, uh, to, sorry, to do a PET scan. But from the cost point of view, of course, SPECT is way more cost efficient. And that's why nowadays uh, SPECT is still used a lot to do actually uh, bone met, so to image the bone metabolism. 